I'm so glad to see so many of you here today. Welcome, welcome to the Future Trends Forum. This is our weekly conversation about the future of higher education. And we have a fantastic guest today, a really, really great scholar and activist, and a wonderful topic. Let's narrow in on our topic. Since March, we've been experiencing an extraordinary situation. Higher education, and indeed the world, has been under the enormous pressure of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've been devoting a lot of our program attention to that ever since. In much of March and in April, we had a lot of sessions focused entirely on COVID and what it means for students, faculty, staff, enrollment, international students, financial sustainability, mental health, as much as we possibly could. Uh, and then in April, we kind of blended in COVID with other topics and other subjects as well. Now in June, uh, we also saw the in the United States, the birth of a brand new wave of Black Lives Matter, anti-racist uh, political um, organization and mobilization. Uh, and we've been addressing that as well. In fact, yesterday we had a special session just focused on anti-racism in higher education. I'm mentioning these two because they shape our programs, they shape our conversations here on the Future Transform, but indeed they shape our lives and our work, and they feed into uh, what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of months. We're going to be talking more about anti-racist movements, we're going to be talking about fall 2020 planning, how to improve our teaching in this, and how to do video conferencing well. All of that is a kind of background hum, a big context all around today's guest. I'm absolutely, absolutely delighted to welcome back Chris Newfield. Uh, Chris is a professor of American Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, he is a leading scholar, indeed a founder of the field of critical university studies. He's a fantastic writer. Um, I can recommend a whole series of his books, um, including this one. Uh, this is The uh, Great Mistake, uh, which he'll be talking about today. Uh, and he has all kinds of wonderful deep research into this topic that we can discuss. So again, I'm very, very glad you can be here today. Greetings, greetings, Professor Newfield. Thanks, Brian, it's great to be back. Well, I'm just, I'm just delighted. Am I coming through all right? You're coming through beautifully, coming through beautifully. Um, but listen, I, I introduced you as a professor at, uh, at Santa Barbara. Before I go further and we talk about our content, uh, can we talk about your uh, your impending move? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm moving to London if I can ever get a visa. Wow. I'm going to be the director of research uh, for uh, something called the Independent Social Research Foundation, wow. which uh, funds interdisciplinary work on philosophy of economics, psychoanalysis and anthropology. Uh, it's looking at uh, economics and decolonization movements in different parts of the world. So it's it's really, uh, it funds a bunch of things that I've kind of been working on over the last few years across disciplines. And I'm really excited that, I mean, this is really the main thing. I'm excited to be able to give people support rather than just, you know, say I'm really interested in your work, but I don't have anything for you. So I'm, <laughs> I'll be in a different position than I've been in as a professor, which is, applying for money for myself, I can now give it out instead. Well, that's a very exciting change. I've, I've been yes. through that precise change myself, once. So I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, but that's that's great news for the rest of us who will probably be coming to you for all kinds of support. <laughs> Please do. At least moral support. Um, well, um, but you're, it, things are in chaos a bit right now. Um, so you, you might make the transatlantic move at some point, depending on what all the stars line up. Right? Yeah, it's going to visa offices are opening later this month and who knows how long the backlog is so i'm going to be doing my london job from santa barbara for at least two more months and maybe longer well good luck good luck with that man. and uh, all best wishes for your, for your new position we're going to have to uh, i think in a year and a half or so uh, bring you back as a guest um it'll be nighttime in london and uh, you'll be uh, even more suave and even more impressive at that point <laughs> Friends, I, I have all kinds of questions uh, to ask uh, Professor Nathan, um, and I just want to start with a couple to get the ball rolling. But remember, the key point here, the future transform, is to hear from you, to hear your thoughts, your questions, and your comments. So again, once you feel like you've got the, uh, uh, the microphone ready and you've got your uh, video camera ready, press the raised hand to join us up here on stage. We're very, very friendly. 
even though between the two of us, we have as much hair as five people. I think. Um, and again, if you can't do video or audio, please just uh, type in, in the chat box or type in the question box and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Chris, you've been a fantastic scholar at the public university. You have at least two great books in the subject. And again, I can't recommend The Great Mistake enough uh, from Johns Hopkins University Press. You, you've expertly and with great depth and detail described how public universities, which are about two thirds of American higher education, have been suffering financially at the hands of state governments and politics over the past well, 40 years right now. And I'm, I'm curious, how do you see the COVID pandemic changing that? I mean, do you think states will continue to cut support for uh, students on uh, a post-student basis? Or is there some other transformation we should be anticipating? Yeah, well, states have just been terrible to their colleges and universities. I mean, I can't say enough bad things about how short-sighted, how ill-spirited uh, most states have been. I mean, there are some exceptions, but not many. And so COVID is another excuse for them to do what they've been doing, which is essentially privatized. Right? I mean, that's one of the main subjects of the book is you um, shifting the uh, cost burden from the taxpayer, which I think is socially just and that the entire society benefits from having a well-educated population to the individual student and their families. And, you know, the result being things that we know quite a bit about now, student debt, um, and the damaging of you know future economic prospects uh, for students by the withdrawing of, of uh, public money from institutions. So the fact that every state is is uh, now having budgetary trouble because of COVID, economic depression, and other costs that COVID is going to uh, impose on everybody means that you know they can cut higher education again the way they have in the past. So it's it's a moment of serious danger for the whole system. Oh. Um, at the, I don't want to dive too much into your book, although it's hard to resist. Um, at, at the end of your book, you have this visionary, visionary conclusion where you call for not just spending more money on public universities, but a reevaluation, uh, a new transvaluation of how we think about higher education. You ask us to think of it as a public common good rather than as a private good. And you wrote this a few years ago. And I wonder, in this past year of such political turmoil and uh, tumult, have you seen anything which indicates that we might be heading in that direction? Yes, well, I'm glad you brought that up because it's also this is also a huge opportunity. And I say that for this reason, so that cuts can't possibly fix this situation. I mean, you can't cut your way out of a, you know, a massive increase in COVID costs, plus a, you know, a period in which, you know, somewhere between 10 and 25% of your, your state workforce is unemployed. Okay. So what it's going to require is a bailout, which I think should be better conceived of as a reconstruction project. Uh, and I'm thinking of this a, kind of as a, as a third reconstruction, right? We had one that didn't work so well after the civil war. Okay. Uh, we had a second one with the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s in which all sorts of um, egalitarian principles were being espoused again, right? Where inequality of outcome um, for, you know, black folks, for women were becoming an unacceptable in a way that, um, you know, pr prompted even mainstream politicians to come up with policy solutions that, you know, at least were tried out for a while. We're in another period like that where the, the grotesqueness of the inequalities that we have both economically and racially and in other ways are no longer, at least for this month and next month, I hope for longer, unacceptable. So we are, we're in a position of going to the federal government and saying, uh, you know, we do need to do massive money creation in order to do a massive uh, first stimulus for both the economy and the university system and then secondly, uh, thinking over a, a three to five year period for the um, quality reconstruction of institutions of, you know, health and education, housing and others that we want. So we're basically we're looking at a new deal, to use that overused phrase, for higher ed, as well as for the environment, um, for racial justice and for a number of other domains at the same time. 
Uh, to put let me, is this another way, I mean, we're, we're used to having a queue in which higher education is usually in the back of it because state leaders say, well, look, I have um, unemployed people, I have disabled people, I have homeless people, I need to do something about supporting them and they don't have any financial resources to bring to the table. You students, on the other hand, you do have some money, you can borrow money and you have, in many cases, family money. So I'm going to uh, cut you first because I have a much harder time cutting these other folks. Um, I think now we're moving into a period where we can see these different social needs as not competitive with each other, but as re all requiring you know stimulus and redevelopment at the same time, where helping housing, helping health, helping education all are, are synergistic and that we could come up with a kind of a, more of a global policy than we've had in the past. You mentioned New Deal, and I, I had to ask, I mean, is the Green New Deal um, one possible framework for this? Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it, first of all, the Green New Deal requires a bunch of research. We still don't really know how to make, um, it, you know, energy intensive uh, renewable sources at the, on the scale that we want. Yeah. Uh, Solar's become much cheaper in the last 10 or 15 years, oh, right? right? Because of China's you know, sort of massive development of it. But there's still a lot of uh, technological research that needs to be done. Uh -huh. uh, another, you know, another area is what, what, what um, is, you know, organization of large scale, say, insulation of, you know, we have what, maybe 20 million dwellings in the United States that need uh, to be insulated basically yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we have, people that don't have jobs. And we can we could imagine, you know, college graduates, uh, non-college folks working together in something like that in a way that would uh, solve a whole bunch of social problems at the same time. I guess, I mean, one of the things I'm excited about is the possibility of taking the university, which has seen been seen as to one side of the lives of ordinary people ooh, ooh. and put it right in the middle of the lives of ordinary people through the solving of practical problems and also providing a workforce that can help implement the solutions that you know researchers come up with in universities that's a, another I, I mentioned you had a powerful uh, vision at the end that i can see that you're still uh, inhabiting that space um which is terrific um in the we've already had a stack of questions starting to come up um and uh, i wanted to make sure that we will uh, have a chance to uh, to respond to them uh, this one just came in here from uh, Greg Stocker. I'll just flash that on the screen. Uh, what? Oops, excuse me. I pressed the right button. I don't know. Um, Greg asks, what happens if a few dozen private colleges close in the next three to six months? How does higher education react as an industry? We get public money to help private colleges so they don't have to close. I mean, it's just <laughs> like there's no other solution. We can't. We can't let all these great little places die just because they're poor. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, some of them, you know, there are some people who say, oh, well, they're not that great in the first place. I, I generally, I would have to be, I would need to see the evidence for that. Because what I see in small private colleges are folks who, you know, lots of dedicated teachers, students that in some cases have limited options. They're not mobile. You know, they can't go across the state to another place where folks have been doing all sorts of good local work that isn't, uh, hasn't achieved financial stability because it's just not well known outside of the, of the region. I mean, schools should not die because they're not famous, right? I mean, that's, it's, that's a terrible yeah. way to deal with this really rich ecosystem that we have of a whole bunch of different kinds of schools that are adapted over decades to their particular kinds of students. So I would like to breach the private public barrier. We already have done it because private universities, including for-profit universities, get federally backed student loans, just to take one example. They get also federal research money uh, in, in billions and billions of dollars. So why not in an emergency, and where we also have longer term social emergency needs as well, uh, provide federal money to backstop the, the state sources and put them into schools like Hampshire College and other places that are struggling mm -hmm. for no fault of their own. Um, that's a great answer. And uh, you've already wowed some folks in the chat box about this. Um, 
let me uh, let me bring in the other of the major two developments now. I think you just made a bridge to that. And then again, I, I would love to hear what uh, everyone says. Keo, I'm, I'm preparing the ground for your question. Um, what hap What about the Black Lives Matter protests? Our sudden great awakening for uh, racial injustice. What What role does that play in terms of public universities now? Well, in addition to the the measures that people are now thinking about again, and I mean, it shouldn't have taken the the, the murder of George Floyd to get have this in the front of our minds. <laughs> But, you know, that's how people are. So here we are, we, you know, so we're, it's now very much in the front of our minds. So we can, I think that the single um, systemic thing that needs to happen is the equalization of funding across public college and university types. Because what we have now is, is a, a form of structural racism in which uh, you, you know, colleges and universities that have the highest proportion of students of color have the lowest per student share of funding by and large coming from their states. So I'm talking about community college, which gets less money per student, I'm talking about regional comprehensive publics, which get less money per student. I'm talking about systems like my own, whether it's Cal State or the University of California, where the, I mean, if it's terrible when you actually look at the numbers. Campuses that have a higher share of students of color, often lower income students, often went to poor high schools in the first place with fewer educational opportunities, are at the campuses that are then giving them fewer educational opportunities again because they have the fewest resources per student. So a simple goal would be <laughs> that could deal with that version of, of systemic racism would be to level up to bring poor schools that are doing uh, the, the noble work of taking lower income students, students of color, first gen immigrant students, DACA students yes. that have gotten fewer resources and fixing that, flipping that around, giving them more resources than they've had in their previous parts of the system. It's not the money isn't everything, you know, I get that, but it's really a lot of it when it comes to education of, of bringing people up to speed if they need that, et cetera. Uh, and DACA, for everyone who uh, might not know the term, is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, uh, referring to um, um, students who are uh, migrants. We can come back to that and explain more about that later if you want. Um, that's, a, that's a very ambitious program. Uh, in the chat, folks have compared this to a Marshall Plan. Um, and, yes. Um, and yeah, that's a great analogy. You know, because when we've had big problems in the past, we've thought big. And for the last 40 years, we've had government taken out of the think big picture and it has to be put back in and the reason for that is that it's really only the government if you just think of it as a coordinating agency that has the capacity to bring collective wealth which is what we're talking about with tax money collective wealth to bear on collective problems so i mean i do think COVID is shifting the discourse towards you know you want to call it socialism whatever label you put on it it's functional and it will it can solve these problems if we think big enough it may just be a huge shock um <laughs> kathleen fitzpatrick and there are at least three different people with that name who participated in our conversation <laughs> so if, if you're the and and, and we delight in all three of them uh mentions it boggles the mind the dollars per student not equal already among federal institution uh it's just true it's just that we have uh such a disorganized, disaggregated um, system. But I want to, I want to make things a little, uh, a little more uh, nervous uh, if I can. Um, and which is to come back to an argument you made in an earlier book um, on making public university. You, you referred to, you established a causal connection in the '70s and '80s um, between rising numbers of uh, particularly black and uh, Latino students. Uh, taking classes as well as a rise in black studies, the Latino studies, and so forth. Uh, and you see that some states then react to that, like California, by defunding campuses on a per student basis. I mean, if that pattern of behavior is still present, then it seems, uh, it seems to me that uh, we should expect a, an accelerated defunding now, uh, especially when people link Black Lives Matter to the university. Well, my hope is if we just call it racism, which is what it is, that people will be, well, 
legislators will have a harder time doing that. I mean, California is a good example. So the, the, um, the chairman of the board of regents of the University of California is a man named John Perez. Mm -hmm. He's also the first, he was the first Latinx speaker of the state assembly. He's the first Latinx chair of the board of regents. He's a first, or he's a very smart guy. He's also in the sort of Jerry Brown austerity wing of the Democratic Party, at least mm -hmm. towards what seems to be the elitist cause of higher education, which okay. I think is a complete misconception about it. But anyway, there's a sense that, you know, other people need the money more um, for reasons we can go into if you're interested. Anyway, he's a guy who's totally anti-racist as a premise of his career. And yet he has produced a defunding, which is the sort of the, de the textbook definition of structural racism, which is as, and I just, I just did a post about this with a chart that makes it really easy to see. As the share of students at the University of California who are white has declined over the last 20 years, the share of state income that goes to the University of California declines in lockstep. It is freakishly exactly proportional, the decline of those two things. And so it's like, oh, you have fewer white students, you're gonna get less, fewer tax dollars. Well, this be, um, I would absolutely yeah. hate that idea. And so my, my hope is that as there's, I mean, this is one of those things where you think that knowledge really make a difference is not just about power. Like maybe people are doing the wrong thing just because they're ignorant. So, I mean, I'm always hoping that often that is the case. I think this may be one of those cases where yeah. someone like John Perez would say, oh, damn, you know, I didn't, I really did not mean to be supporting that pattern. And now I'm not going to. Um, this would be a good time for me to uh, remind folks that um, there is a, uh, um, there are links to, um, to resources so on the bottom left of your screen. You should see a kind of yellow orange uh, button for um, Chris's uh, excellent, excellent blog, you're making the university. Um, we have a, a, a few comments in which I just wanted to share, and then we have a, a, a really powerful question. Uh, Stephen Downs from Canada uh, says that um, we benefit from social services, such as public health and education, which blunt some of the effects of racism and prejudice. Even so, the pandemic is forcing a rethink of just how fairly the benefits of society are distributed. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Stephen. Um, we have a question from Kiel, uh, I'm sorry, Kiel Dutch. Uh, and Keel, I keep massacring your last name, so you need to tell me exactly how to pronounce it, so I can do it completely right. Um, who has economic questions. And I think you miss a big factor in higher ed costs, which is the unjust degree system, credential cartel, and mandated four years of seat time. Would you support third party credentialing? Third party, what was the last word? Uh, credentialing. Yeah, I'll put it back. Um, yeah, it really depends on the. I mean, I, I would like. Um, institutions of higher learning to be credentialed themselves by whatever accrediting, you know, cr crediting agencies are one way of doing it. They're imperfect. I'm not opposed to new entrants. Uh, and I'm not opposed to the idea that people can accelerate and don't need to sit for three years or four years or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite possible. Um, I just think that that concept has been used as a as an excuse for shortcuts around learning that we have to look at carefully. But I, I'm not categorically opposed to that at all. Um, I, I, Keel's talking about the opposite end of this. Um, he, he's not referring to accreditation of individual colleges and universities. He's referring instead to uh, accreditation of students. So students. No, I understand. I just, I, I, I changed the subject to, I also okay. want those people to be accredited. <laughs> Got it. No. Um, thank you, Keel. If you, if you want to follow up with more, uh, He's uh, right now can't appear on video, but um, I appreciate you following that line of thought. Um, uh, George Station, who is uh, not too far from here, um, Chris, um, at least on the continental scale, he's at uh, Cal State. He points out the Cal State system has also experienced the same defunding issue that uh, you described as student uh, demographics have changed. Um, and he has a good link to the uh, resource there. Um, so I, I have a couple more questions to ask, but. Friends, the, the forum is yours. In fact, um, here, let me put this up here. Uh, you should see a kind of teal colored box. Uh, so if you'd like to join us on stage, your camera and mic are working, you should just be able to click that button and uh, appear on stage. 
Uh, otherwise, if you want to run a topic past me, just type it in the uh, question box. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear more. Um, one of the questions I, I, I had to ask is, um, state governments often go on a he who pays the piper calls a tune model. Um, and I have heard, and you've heard this I know as well, uh, some <laughs> academic leaders say, well, privatization is good because it gets us out from the the problem of our state government. Um, it's possible that if we follow your, your model, we get a Marshall Plan or a Green New Deal or so on, that expands state and also federal funding, uh, that we might see greater demands for state and or federal control of things like uh, curriculum, uh, uh, academic quality, and so on. Um, how, how would you negotiate that kind of uh, uh, strings attached phenomenon? Sorry, sorry, Brian, I, could, I didn't understand the sentence before the strings attached sentence. Sorry, I'm um, just saying that if uh, state governments and federal government want to spend more money on this, they might want to uh, control or issue more requests about things in terms of curricula, student, uh, student freedom of speech, uh, uh, yeah. uh, programs, quality, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, so this is a this is a big uh, cultural issue in the United States. I mean, when did we become a country in which everybody spends their all, half their time telling everyone else how to do their job? But that's <laughs> that's basically what's happened with like everybody knows how to teach better than teachers. You know, politicians know better, CEOs know better, Elon Musk certainly knows better how to teach than I do. So when where do we draw the line? I just I'd like to see some real pushback on strings on money that goes into you know the activities that you're just trusting professionals to know how to do right we can't watch doctors do surgery or have somebody in the room with the patient while they're getting a cancer diagnosis and talking about treatments and we don't want to do that and the same is true with with teaching i'm mean, teaching is much more politicized historically in the united states than medicine but i think the states will do better with community colleges any level of education if they just they send the money and get out of the way and let people do their jobs we have enough internal checks we have enough reviewing going on all the time of everything that all of us do inside of institutions <laughs> so it's like i i know this sounds obnoxious but i, I think this is actually uh, epistemologically and operationally defensible send us the money and leave us alone and we will send you really well-educated students. And you can check up on us, but don't micromanage us around either the metrics or the process that gets us there. Wow, that's tricky. Um, it's tricky, but I understand democratic accountability, but yeah. that we've gone way over to, um, on the side of, mi of micromanaging and micromanaging of, not, of experts by non-experts. And that doesn't work. I mean, you're you're an Americanist by uh, by training and by inclination and, and practice. Uh, what what do you think in in our current society supports that? Uh, is it just a, a declining? Is, is it partly our, our increased skepticism of experts? Is it um, a kind of frustrated lowercase d democratic desire that uh, national politics doesn't really support or, or want? Well, it's a 50 year uh, campaign is, you know, culture wars is one term for it of uh, to discredit public sector employees as caring about the quality of their product. Right. I mean, it's called, uh, you know, Nancy McLean's written a, a good book about this with James Buchanan and the, the public choice movement within economics. That's one one piece of this that it, essentially the argument was. Well, look, teachers and firefighters and all those folks, they're just gain maximizers like you and me. They're, they're just in it for the best salary and the best pension they can possibly get out of you, the taxpayer. So first of all, you've got to be as cheap as possible with them because they're going to screw you otherwise. And then secondly, you got to micromanage their product because they're basically lazy and they're just trying to collect a paycheck and get a pension. And I, that is totally fundamentally opposed, A, to my theory of human nature, because I think people like to work and like to do a good job. Yeah. Secondly, it's totally opposed to my personal experience of people, yeah. which is that people like to work and like to do a good job. I don't know anybody that wants to do a crappy job. I mean, I know people who aren't paid enough. I know people who have four teaching jobs, and so they can't spend enough time on any one of them. 
I know people that are, you know, micromanaged, and so they can't do their job as well. As, they can't enact their own personal vision of their job on the job, right? But I, I just don't know um, that the public choice crisis is a fake. It's a fake crisis, and we need to exit that period of mistrust so that we can all just assume that we, you know, can we're all doing the job well enough so we can go actually do our jobs instead of trying to control how other people's are doing theirs. Well, it's a fascinating problem. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned this. Um, you know, you think in the K through 12 level, how we have a lowercase d democratic scrutiny over teaching, uh, especially in public uh, um, schools. Um, but this is a little different. Um, we've seen some, uh, some countervailing discussion in the chat. We had, um, Phil Katz, a fellow Americanist, said there's a 200 plus year old tradition of healthy American distrust and expertise. Um, Jessica Surden uh, does ask this question. Uh, I agree with pushback by professors, but I've seen some poor professors who can't take criticism. How do we criticize professors who aren't doing their job if there's no way for them to take it seriously? If there's no way for them to take what seriously? Criticism. Oh, well, the, professors. A, they have to take criticism seriously. B, we do. <laughs> I mean, I the, the the professor that does not accept criticism needs to be, you know, d disciplined by peers. So there's the department peers, there's department chairs, there's deans, there's a whole series of of managers. Who are in fact responsible for maintaining a, a peer review process, and I, I also I don't I don't want to sound like a I just think professionals should rule everything. I I am a Democrat, small D. I I do think that accountability is important. I do think the general public should be able to see into institutions and understand how they're working, yes. and see what the real problems are. And I do think that the general public's view about whether we're doing a good job or not is really important. It's so. How do we get these these things into combination? How do how do I hear what you were saying about what I'm doing wrong, without you just prescribing solutions that I know aren't going to work, and then enacting metrics that will require me <laughs> to do things that I think aren't going to work, right? How do we? So it has to be worse of some kind of a political dialogue that is time consuming and which is. And here's the important point. It's very different from uh, audit culture, uh, public choice suspicion structure, which is what we have too much of right now. This is an important dynamic. Uh, and you're, you're hitting a whole series of key points, which is bringing up uh, questions uh, all over the place. And I want to give some people um, their chance to uh, share those. Uh, we have uh, Sarah San Gregorio, uh, who says, this week we're studying Henry Giroux. It tracks what you're saying about systematic issues around micromanaging instructors. What parts of academia can work to mitigate this? CTLs, admins? To mitigate micromanagement? Yeah. Uh, this, I think it's gotta be a cultural shift away from, you know, sort of top, top down and more, more towards more cooperation. And it's also gonna do require something that you know, most professors don't love that much, which is kind of peer immersion in long meetings involved. Yeah. You know, it's like 360 review and it is like you are also being reviewed. And it's just it's just more more of the week involved in those kinds of, of meeting based discussions. I think we're going to have to bite the bullet and do that. The alternative is a professional management that is not involved in the the teaching learning research complex right. and you know therefore you know just does kind of it does audit because it, it's not there and it doesn't know i i would love to see for example the very large student affairs silo that has been developed for good reasons in universities opened up and put into direct connection with the classroom the laboratory the library because we have a whole parallel educational apparatus and it would be cheaper and it would be less, you know, telling you what to do ish if we brought these two groups together and, you know, around, for example, we're going to have to do hybrid courses and we're going to have to make them good. And there's all sorts of 
great versions of, you know, of, um, you know, community-based um, hybrid learning that universities should be doing more of as a rule. But that requires somebody like me, who's good at preparing content, but who is not a, a designer in terms of interfaces and so on, mm -hmm. having access to several other people that can really help me with the course and that we would maybe end up doing, you know, performing together mm -hmm. as a team. That's the uh, little structural design paradigm. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we just, we don't have that now at a public university with limited resources. I just came out of a budget meeting where campus is planning to cross the board cut of 6.72%. Mm. And that's just the beginning. That's the floor of the cut. Mm. Where are departments that are already, were already cut 10 years ago and have never recovered from that, yeah. going to find $100 to hire even an undergraduate to help me with a court, with course design, much less a professional person? especially if they're thinking in a more conservative way, trying to stick to what they know well, not to do something uh, new. Yeah. Yeah. So we, A, we need more funding. And we haven't even talked about COVID costs and the whole health issue that we're dealing with. Right. B, we need, we are going to make education, instructional delivery and learning more expensive, not cheaper, if we do proper online. It does not save money to do it well. It costs money to do well, and I. It's not only it's, it's not only upfront costs. I think it's gonna it's higher permanent costs because you're getting sophisticated teams together with serious uh, sort of complementary professional skills, and they can't just film it and walk away. No. They have to continuously implement it. I mean, here's a, this is another plus thing. That I don't know if we have time to talk about this or not, but I do think COVID is actually an opportunity for educational upgrade. You know, the the MOOC, the, the mass scale MOOC wave of 2012 and 2013 mm -hmm. was overblown, but it made one really good point, which is that push delivery in large lectures does not work very yeah. well. And yet that's the only thing that public universities can afford. Yeah. So maybe now we can rethink because we have to because COVID is destroying the the massification paradigm at least for a year or two years at least for that long maybe forever um why don't we take this as an opportunity to demassify for real and then bite the cost bullet and go to the state and go to the federal government and say everything those guys those tech folks from silicon valley told you about how you know, zero marginal cost of instruction for all millions of students. That was wrong. They, we lied to you, or we just didn't know. Now we know that it's going to cost a lot of money, but we really want to do this, and we know that you want to do it too. We, we have, this is a great thought, and, and I, I want to keep the plate spinning. There's, there's questions that came up following everything you've said, every point. Uh, questions about change. Uh, Mark, can we put these two up here, one after the other, because they're really, they're your sibling questions. Uh, Mark Johnstone at the University of New Haven asks how faculty can be encouraged to work collaboratively better and to collectively improve practice. Men models you mentioned appear to front supervisory processes like 360 review, et cetera. So hang on to that question. How do you get faculty to do this? And then at the same time from uh, the Houston area, Tom Haynes asks, how would you operationalize the general public understanding the often diffuse outcomes universities produce. So one question is how do you, these are questions about change of a complex mm -hmm. organism. How do you get the whole public thinking better about what higher education actually does? And then how do you get faculty to work more collaboratively or collectively like that? And those are two massive great questions. Uh, just the, the faculty, the simple answer is buy out their time. Because well, the single biggest obstacle, to, I mean, there's also there's other psychological ones and, and malformation of professional life and stuff like that. But the biggest one is collaboration means time I don't have being sucked out of basically my private life. So, you know, the way that all of us protect our teaching and our research and our service ratios, which are already kind of three jobs in one, is by not going to the next meeting right? Just saying, forget it. I can't do that. If that next meeting is about collaborative instruction and about redesigning the department's entire curriculum so that it fits together better, which I think in most cases, it would be a good thing. Yeah. Um, 
then that time has to be something else has to be taken away as an obligation and one an obligation has to be subtracted so universities have to be much more creative about relieving that particular burden and i think folks will show up if they can find the time to do it because we're all worried about our teaching we're all worried about our students then the other the short answer to that other excellent question is um open up the black box you know, we, we need uh, people to be able to see what happens in the classroom. How do students learn? How do you, I mean, how do, how do you figure something out? You know, how do I know how to read this sentence that I couldn't uh, read three minutes ago? Or how does the, you know how the, you're doing a problem set and some equation suddenly falls into place? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it didn't honestly, like five minutes before it was completely opaque and you were the dumbest person on the, on the planet and now you totally get it we have to talk about that like what enables that how what staffing what academic labor is involved with that Ooh. how it varies from student to student how students of color have been you know put in schools where they you know in most cases where they haven't gotten the kind of support they need to have more of those moments mm -hmm. i get the college you know all, we have to have the multi-dimensional social version of the conversation about the cognition of instruction and the institutional basis for that mm -hmm. um and i think that that will help people get it we just we don't show. one last piece of this is we're now in a position where uh, where the educate the sorry the economic payoff of it, higher education is more uncertain to put it politely yes. right the so the wage premium between college and high school is is maintaining itself right. and growing only because the high school <laughs> is going down and so we we all have tons of really good students who go out there and they spend years trying to get their foot on the ladder now and they can't pay their loans back and this is not this is the moment for universities to stop overemphasizing the pecuniary or the monetary benefits stop selling the ba as primarily a wage benefit and start talking about all these other things involved with you know personal development building uh education for citizenship education for a post-racist society uh for the, you know, the whole range of, ca of human capabilities that people get by having these additional four years that are intellectually usually more intense than high school was. Just uh, two quick notes for everyone. I'm going to bring uh, one person up on stage. Um, the uh, wage premium is the difference um, in lifetime earnings between someone who has a college degree and someone who hasn't gotten one. And uh, Bildung is a wonderful German term for uh, education, but character creation and more. It's a great term we don't really translate well into, uh, into English. Uh, we have on video uh, Phil Katz coming to us from the Council for Independent Colleges. Phil, how are you doing, sir? I'm, I'm good. I hope you can hear me. Yes? Beautiful. Beautiful. Good. And I should say I'm talking for, my, for myself today, not for CIC, although I appreciate um, uh, Chris's comments earlier about the value of private colleges also um, as producers of the public good. So I'm listening here and I'm, I'm conflicted because I agree with a lot of what you say, but I don't think you're convincing me. Um, what can we say right now to talk about, especially public universities, but also private colleges, about instruments of the public good? I want to push you a little further on where you just were. What are the arguments that in this very specific moment where it's so difficult for people to appreciate public goods, what are the arguments that are working? And I don't think the argument that says we provide Bildung is an argument that's going to make California taxpayers open their, their pockets more. I only partly agree with that last one. I don't think we've tried it. I don't think we've taken the risk of saying, look, you want your kids to be happy. You want to be happy. You want to be able to think about things accurately. You want them to be able to be in a relationship with people that's not just about arguing and conflict how do you how do you deal with differences how do you deal with racial gender sexuality differences how do you how do you read a ballot proposition so you know whether you're about to be screwed or not you want education at this level to do that so you have k through 12 which is about 
learning the fundamentals and about learning the basics of knowledge, the processes whereby you acquire knowledge. Then that you want this comp combined pecuniary, non-pecuniary thing. I'll just put it in one sentence, which is the, the, the capabilities of, um, that allow people to produce knowledge rather than simply consume it, which is also a prerequisite for doing well in the current economy. So it's kind of a two, two birds. Right. And that's an argument that we've been trying to, to make about higher education for years. And I think that it, it's getting less and less traction. I'm troubled, especially at this moment, because there's such a divided sense of where public good exists. If we look at the title of the session about, about COVID and Black Lives Matter, you know, on the one hand, you see a number of the protests about Black Lives Matter, which are a tremendous demonstration of a sense of larger public good, especially the fact that you see such a diversity of protesters. And then you see so many reactions to COVID being a denial of individual contributions to the public good. And so when you compare these two very strong reactions right now of Black Lives Matter protests and folks screaming in the face of Walmart workers because they've been asked to wear a mask to come in, um, boy, I don't know how we make convincing arguments about about colleges being the most important or even an important public good in this in this very you know parlous moment. Well, I, I yeah, I mean, this is, these are great questions. So I don't at all mean to just come back and act like I, you know, here's the formula because I, sure. you're pointing out that there isn't a formula and we have to grow up our way to a, a better discourse. So I, I just want to acknowledge that. The first thing though is I think we can't um, over focus on, you know, the guys screaming in the faces of the Wisconsin State House, you know, the guards, the, the security people that were there and take them as normative Americans. I mean, we over focus with the very systematic help of the media on a fringe of, you know, really primitive, selfish individualists that I do not think are very typical even of Trump voters, much less of the wider uh, population. I mean, it's not, an, I mean, I, I come from Republicans, right? So it's, I just, nobody, none of my family is really in that zone. And that's true of my other Republican friends here. But the second thing is um, you're pointing at it, what I think is a deep cultural and even spiritual crisis in the United States that has been part of our, you know, experience as a country really since the end of the Cold War, you know, it was the Cold War kind of sutured us to this World War II greatest generation, defeating the Nazis, understanding of who we really were in spite of, you know, slavery, racism, genocide, et cetera, and all the other stuff that's also, you know, central part of our history. And we kind of repressed that. And then the great crusade against first, you know, Nazism and then communism is kind of over. And we have this strange period of, you know, what is it? Is it, is it really going to be Silicon Valley and high technology? Is it, Wealth inequality, is that what the United States is going to devote itself to? Is it, uh, are we a theocracy? I mean, none of the, none of the candidates that get the most attention have, will do the job. They don't, they don't work. So what universities are not doing anymore is putting in a bid for a vision of what the national purposes are, right? It's not just one. And I think when we do that, we'll also be able to explain what the point of college is more easily. When we we recreate recreate the Boston Boston idea. idea. Yeah, it would be a version of that. Yeah. But it has to be updated, right? It's not the 19th century. It's not the 1950s. It's not the 1990s, as I never tire of saying. Right. So we're going to, we have to update it in all the ways that this amazing population that we actually have could help us do. Good luck to all of us, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you for the great question and uh, yeah. all the work you do. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, we have, uh, we're almost out of time, friends. We are just at the end of, uh, of our minutes, and we have time for a, a, just about one more question to go. Um, and I, um, I wanted to bring this one up because this will take up across a few different folks. Uh, this is an economic question, I'm afraid. Um, 
What about the possibility of cutting costs comes the question. Uh, let's see, a few folks like uh, Keel Dermish and a few others have mentioned uh, problems of uh, too much staff um, or too much administrative, administrative uh, uh, superstructure on campuses, as well as non-academic uh, functions, uh, such as sports, residential uh, uh, domains have been mentioned. Um, and then also a few folks like uh, Stephen Dowlings have argued for the possibility of reducing costs in order to make up colleges and universities more accessible to everybody, which is you know, a, a foundational point of public higher education. Um, what do you, I mean, is, is this something that we can try or are college and universities already cut so badly with the bone that it's, uh, that's not possible? Well, I think it's both. I mean, I, there are certainly things that we could do, but a, a lot of the, the serious cost savings are going to be de-staffing, which just means firing people. I mean, that's the, that's the, I mean, that's what the meeting was about that I was just in, you know, or tiptoeing around layoffs, basically. Um, I'm not interested in that. I mean, I'm really I'm very anti layoff. I'm very pro refunctioning people. So I wonder if we could cut um, costs over a five to 10 year period by doing closer collaborations among people that are in these silos. So the example of um, course designers and professors working together, you know, to do sort of complicated course delivery that would increase learning, that might be one. But we're not spending that much, you know, spend like 8,000 a year, 10,000 a year per student for tertiary education is, it's not a, a lot, it's not that much. Where we're, we're not blowing money on instruction. You know, we've adjunctified mm -hmm. instruction terribly. We have to dial that back. We have to actually raise costs or instruction by paying people properly and giving them stable jobs so that you know to have any kind of you know act decent ethics around academic labor we're going to spend more money there uh, one thing that would help is by requiring um research sponsors extramural research sponsors to pay the full cost of doing the actual research that's something that i talk about in the book yeah. what's happening now is but you know, it's between 20 and 25 cents of every dollar of research expenditure is being supported by either state taxpayers or student tuition. So some of the money that students would put directly into their own classrooms and that would allow for non-tenure track people to be tenure track people or to get paid a proper salary instead of a per course charge of you know cost of like three or four thousand dollars is going into research subsidy because research is expensive and universities don't have other sources and the sponsors are not paying the proper amount. So there's those kinds of, it's a, it's a holistic kind of package that we have to do. There isn't going to be one thing. The place where I just, I do not think we should start by cutting the workforce. I think we should start with, with restructuring the, the business model so that the, the outside beneficiaries pay something closer to the full cost of what they're getting back. Well, that would be a very difficult thing. Um, yeah, it's a big political lift for sure. We have more questions coming in and time. And I hate to um, let me ask you on behalf of everybody, what's the best way to keep up with you and your work? Is it your Twitter or your uh, wonderful YouTube uh, effort? Brian, I think what you're asking, Bad Sound, is a venue for contact. So the blog, I think, is a good place to start. The remake, it's remaking the, the university. Uh, it's a blog spot blog. It's pretty easy to find. Um, people are welcome to email me at, at the English department at, at UCSB if you have you know particular issues you'd like to pursue. Um, I will <laughs> I will root through the chaos of my inbox and find you. So I'm I'm happy to continue this conversation. I'm, I'm really glad that I'm grateful to you, Brian, for bringing the people together like this and so regularly. First of all, Chris, thank you for driving this conversation, and second, my thanks to the wonderful. 
uh, community here are brilliant, brilliant folks who've been asking fantastic questions. Uh, this is a uh, uh, a wonderful uh, community that I'm I'm just delighted to be uh, part of. Um, we have to uh, let you go back to uh, your work, uh, but let me wish you all best in uh, trying to keep your UC uh, going through this uh, incredibly stressful time. And let me wish you all best luck in your move across the country and across the Atlantic. Thank you, Brian, and thanks everybody. I um, I look forward to the next time. Well, so do we. So do we. But don't go, friends. I just want to point out a couple more things, uh, and and for coming up for the next few weeks. Uh, first of all, we're continuing um, a whole series of topics. Uh, Black Lives Matter and anti-racism in higher education. We're going to try to have more extra sessions about that. So if you want to reach out to me for suggested uh, speakers, please do. Uh, we have fall 2020 planning with all kinds of issues, uh, improving teaching and how to do live video well. Uh, we also continue to have these conversations go on social media, uh, Twitter, using the hashtag FTTE, but also our groups on LinkedIn, Slack, and Facebook. So we'd love to hear from you there. Um, our archive continues to grow. We have 213 videos there now. So if you'd like to dive back into our great conversations, including Chris's first appearance, please do. Uh, and in the meantime, thank you again for all of your thoughts, your conversation. This has been a really, really rich uh, discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Stay safe. See you online. Bye-bye.